And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Take your Bibles and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, we're going to talk about loving. Love gives us character. If there are kids still here, you're welcome to go down the hallway to our uh, kids program. Uh, I think uh, Anita's down there teaching today. So 1 Corinthians chapter 13, Jennifer, it's good to have you back here and well and all that kind of stuff, although she'll be gone again next week, spending some time with some family, but uh, we love you. Yeah. So 1 Corinthians chapter 13, we continue our series called Love and Life, and we're going to talk about, last week we actually talked about how uh, love brings us a care or a compassionate for other people. Can you, we turn up the lights just a little bit more, please? Um, yeah, all of us who can't see, you know, really need that help. Who, who said thank you? Yeah. Wait, you're young. You have eye issues. Oh, wait, you have issues. Okay, let's move on. Hey, I... I need to say this. We um, Just a couple of weeks ago, we made some changes to our leadership team here at church, and I wanted to say thank you to some new folks that have joined our leadership team, and I'm going to ask you if I call your name or when I call your name to stand up. Gordon Hodges, Gordon, if you would stand. Um, he can't see either, but uh, Gordon Hodges and Katie Whitlow and Michael Hendricks. These three folks joined our leadership team, and our current leadership team includes uh, Bruce Elgin. Bruce, if you would stand. Cassim Adams. Doug Mosley, Jennifer McDaniel, who is in, just went to the bathroom, and my wife, Julie, who is in the bathroom as well. She's not in the bathroom. She's in the nursery. There we go. I'm, she's back there. That's what I... Yeah, we do need some folks to help in the nursery, and you could see Katie, you could see Julie to help with that. But these are our leadership team. If you need to speak with someone about church business, these are the folks that will do that. They're also the ones that speak back to me, and we need each other. Amen? Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you all very much. <clears throat> that was extra, okay? That was extra. Uh, we need to take another step. Um, last week, we talked about how we care, how love leads us to care for others. But at this point, I want to talk about how love leads us to have character that's inside of us or built in us that helps us in how we deal with others. Not just how we see others, caring for them, being compassionate, but how we deeply care. And those relationships that I want to talk about today are those that are closest to us. You know, this week, Wednesday, Valentine's Day, marriage, that first relationship that comes to my mind is we need to love our spouses the way that Jesus wants us to love our spouses. Amen? Some of you are looking for spouses. We can help you with that not at church. Um, <laughs> but seriously, those relationships, how about our kids? I mean, we love our kids. Uh, we, we had conversations this morning about some grandchildren. I wish God would have given us those first because they're much more precious than our children. That's all there is to it. But seriously, these folks that are related to us, but how about our neighbors? He said, love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and then love your neighbors yourself. Our neighbor is not just the guy or the girl that lives next door to us. It's the people we come in contact with, right? I, I'm grateful for my neighbors. Are you? Amen. I was running down the road, and I saw one of you driving towards me, and I'm glad that, Liz, you swerved the other way rather than hit me, and I appreciate that. And you had your great-granddaughter with you, Maddie, right? I, I want us to love like Jesus loves. I want you to think about that from 1 John chapter 4. Jennifer read several of these during that song. 1 John chapter 4, beginning of verse 7. Dear friends, let us continue to love one another. For love comes from God, and anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God. But anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. And God showed how much He loved us by sending His one and only Son into the world so that we might have eternal life through Him. This is real love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. So the origin of love, the beginning of love, is God Himself. Amen? He is the start of it, and he's also the example of it. He shows us how to love. Can keep showing up for people, even when the people aren't very nice. Keep showing up, like Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, when they did things that God told them not to do, what did he do? God still showed up. In fact, he covered their sins, forgave their sins, just like he's done for you and I. I want us to understand today, when real love takes root in our lives, we will have the characteristic of godliness or godly love toward the people around us those close to us and those even far from us. Maybe it's our, our neighbors who need that or our co-workers or our kids or whoever it might be that God has taught us to love. The more he 
teaches us, the more that we'll love them. Just like that song says, this is how we fight our battles. And if you've ever seen pictures around that song, it, people are typically showing you a Bible. This is how we fight our battles. By the way, the, the best power in the world is not in a gun to keep the bear away like Michael talked about. The best, the best weapon in the world is the Word of God. Anybody else? I have hidden, David said, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against God. The word of God is what we need because the word of God reminds us who is in complete control. Ephesians chapter 6, it says, put on the full armor of God so that you can stand firm against what? Krispy Kreme? (laughs) No, the wiles of the devil. The, the, The prince and power of the air, the, the enemy of this world, the enemy of us. We have a, a way to battle him in the Word of God. And I want you to see this today in a deeper, deeper way. I want you to notice, Paul wrote the book of 1 Corinthians, wrote most of the New Testament, but he wrote this book, this letter, 1 Corinthians, to the church that is at Corinth, and he gave them a lot of different things. Paul corrected some of their wrongs, but for the larger portion of this text or this scripture or, or this letter that he penned to them, he was helping them understand how to walk it out, how to live out the Christian faith. Each of us are on a journey some of you, your journey is a little bit more crooked than others. Some of you, it's a little more hilly. For, for some of us, it, it includes addiction or it includes um, desperation, uh, probably most of us. But all of us have a journey that we're on. And God says, here's the deal. When you're on your journey, live like this. Does that make sense? I'm going to talk. You're going to talk back to me, okay, in nice ways. Yes, this makes sense because I'm preaching. I mean, because the scripture says it. And and as Paul writes, he says, you as a Christ follower will have a changed life if you follow me and stay close to me. As we read this this scripture or these verses together, again, Jennifer read most of these to us. As you look at these or read these scriptures with me, I, I want you to see or maybe even take note of what does love really look like? Let's stand together. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, we're going to read verses 4 through 10. I'll read aloud. They'll be on the screen. You just read along silently. Here we go. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the love chapter, beginning in verse 4. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable. It keeps no record of being wrong. It does not rejoice about injustice, but it rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith, always hopeful, endures through every circumstance. But prophecy and speaking in tongues and special knowledge will become useless, but love will last forever. Now our knowledge is partial and incomplete, and even the gift of prophecy reveals only part of the whole truth or the whole picture. But when the perfect time comes... These partial things will become useless. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you most of all that you are love. And God, I pray for those areas of our life. Maybe there's something going on that we just are asking and we need an answer. Or or maybe there's somebody in our life that's really being difficult to love. Or maybe it's me, Lord. I'm difficult to love. Maybe Maybe it's us personally here. But God, I pray that today you would speak to our hearts, Lord Jesus, that we may act like, talk like, represent you. Because you are love, you are awesome, and I need you. I thank you that you're the Savior of the world. I thank you that you forgive our sins. I thank you that you take us not just for a day, but you take us for an eternity. So God, will you please pave this journey or this path that we're on with the principle, the characteristic, the the truth of godliness so that our relationships would look like what you made them to be, encouraging, life-giving relationships. Thank you for sending Jesus to be that example in that life. In his name, Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. Huh. I struggle. Did, did you all hear me? Okay. Um. Will you be honest at, as it <laughs> is your reality too? Do you struggle? 
I know some of you. <laughs> you on the struggle bus. And Mac, you, you got the front row seat. <laughs> I do. Why? Life is difficult. I didn't tell you to look at your wife and say, wife is difficult. That's not what I said, okay? She's in the back. I can't. She might be lit. I love you. She just actually texted me. She's cute. Yeah. Um, no, she didn't need help, no. Life is difficult because life is. Life is full of all kinds of circumstances, most of the time that are outside of our control. Bruce, you told us about one this morning. I can't control my daughter's temperature, and she's 12-hour drive, 6-hour flight. I can't get there. Life is difficult. My health is failing. Pastor Miguel, you've had a hospital stay recently. Difficult. Life is difficult. Jobs. Anybody got a job you'd like to take this job? That's a different story, right? We, so, some of us have those jobs, right? Some of us have relationships, or we have neighbors, or we have kids, and, and we don't know what to do. Here's the deal. I struggle, and because I struggle, I need somebody to teach me, tell me, show me, what does it look like to have a life that's a little bit better than what I can have all by myself? I don't want to tell you about a little tiny bit better. I want to tell you about a good bit better, and his name is Jesus. And, and what Paul is writing to us in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is the understanding of how to apply the truth of God is love. Now, I've got to tell you up front, God is love. Amen? Amen. But God is also a judging God and a fair God. Because if, if your sins and your life is not hidden behind the power of the cross, the Savior of the world whose name is Jesus, you will burst tail wide open upon your death. But the grace of God, the goodness of God is this. For God so loved the world, Michael and you, that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever will believe in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Y'all with me? You're probably going to see it today at the Super Bowl. Somebody's going to have John 3.16 plastered across their chest. Or a Tim Tebow, right? John 3.16 across their eyebrow. Something like that. There's going to be reminders. We need to be the reminders, church. That God's good. He is love. We've talked about it in the last couple of weeks. Are we pushing people down? Or are we building them up? You see, the love of God, loving the way God loves, lifts people up. Takes burdens from them. It doesn't burden them down anymore. And I want to tell you, I struggle. Sometimes I load the burdens up on people. Julie. <laughs> and I need to learn not to do that. Listen to what Tony Evans says about this passage. He says, Paul explains what love does and what love does not do. Biblical love is the decision, not merely a feeling, to compassionately have concern for someone else righteously based on God's standards and sacrificially giving to meet a need, seeking the well-being of somebody else. Here's my thought. Lasting, real, godly love does for others without seeking anything in return. That's the farthest thing from what the world says love is. Because the world says, if you do for me, I'll do for you. The world says, if you pay the price, you can have what you want. That the world says, if you do it my way, you can get my burger or whatever it is. <laughs> In fact, I, I'll, I'll feed your need if you'll just jump through this hoop or, or take this job or, or take this medicine or all different kinds of ways. Listen, you can go to the self-help section of every self-help book or counseling set, wherever you want to go. And they're going to tell you all kinds of things about love. Try this, try this, try this. I want to tell you, if you don't start with the Word of God, you're going to start in the wrong place. Amen. And if you're not being fed by the deliverer, you're being fed by the deceiver. If you're not being shaped by the Savior, you're being misshaped by the servant called Satan. And he is a servant but he's not the one I need. 
John 3, 13, 34 says, A new commandment I give to you, love one another as I have loved you, so you ought to love one another. And I want to tell you today, the, there are three things from this scripture, from these verses, 4 through 10, 1 Corinthians 13, that tell us about love. It's a pattern, if you will. Our relationships matter because they are to look like, act like, be examples of Jesus and how he really loves. So may we see through this passage, believe from this passage, and even go toward Jesus through this passage. Point number one, the characteristics of of love. I, I told you last week what that girl who sang the song, what's love got to do? Got to, I want to tell you, if your, your marriage, your relationships aren't patterned after the love of God, you're going to have issues. Anybody got issues? <laughs> Don't point at them. Cross your, yeah, there you go. Don't point at them. Why? Because you know what the number one issue in your relationships is? Take your finger like this. Turn it right back here. Don't be pointing at me. <laughs> no, but at you. I, we are the number one issues because if we're, if we're just trying to hold somebody else accountable, here's the deal. The number one person you're supposed to hold accountable is you, me. I can't control them. I wish I could control them. I'll tell you, I'd control them really well. No, that's not how it works. I got to control me because my temper or my... I've told you this before. A thermometer tells you what the temperature is. A thermostat sets the temperature in the room. Be a thermostat. Be, be a thermostat that says, I am not going to let them get me down. Be a thermostat that says, I, I am not, I'm not going to allow my situation to tear apart my value. I, I am not going to let my boss or my situation at work take me to the place where I'm willing to steal or to talk about them behind their back. I'm going to take character, the character of godliness, of godly love, and apply it to my relationships across the board, at home, at work, and around the world. Here's the deal. When you don't like something that's going on, stop talking about it and start praying about it why because you and i just like these cards across here and some of you may have other cards to put up here we have a, a god who loves us so much who says bring me my, your burdens leave your burdens at the altar and i'll take them from you why because i love you and i care for you and i'll give you rest anybody need rest from their burdens <laughs> I don't know about you, but sometimes I just want to kick the people out of my, out of my house because they, they, they're my burdens. You know what? My, I'm the burden. I want to get honest with this. So the characteristics, here, here it is. It's really, really simple. Verse number four, it says, love is patient, love is kind. <laughs> Love's not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. There, there's just a few things here we're going to get to. We're going to pull them apart. First of all, patient. Anybody have extra patience? I don't. My hand's up because I'm the illustration, Okay. I'm not a doctor. I don't need patience. <laughs> I, I, am, I don't have much patience. Have you ever prayed for patience before? Don't pray for patience. Don't do that. Why don't pray for patience? Because you're probably going to have a difficult time, just like I almost fell on the stage just then. I, I want you to understand that patience is a virtue that I don't have. Anybody else? The more we walk with Jesus, the more patience we will have. Have you found that to be true? Well, let me... Let me put some illustration with that. If you choose to walk with Jesus, you put a target on you. For the wages of sin is death. That's, that's the reality. Listen to this way. We'll go to John 14, verse number 6. It says, Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father through me. I want you to hear that. But turn back to John chapter 10. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I come that you might have life and have how, how do we have that abundance? How do we do that? Well, the only way to do that is to understand the closer I get to Jesus, the better I have help with my situations, the better I understand my wife. In fact, the scripture tells me to study her, get to know her. How do I do that or why do I do that? So that I love her and sometimes I need to be patient with her and I definitely need her to be patient with me. How about the situations around me? I need to be patient with the people around me. Anybody else need some patience today? It's a word from God. This is a God's wisdom. Let's go back to James chapter 3, verse number 17. In our last series, this was a verse I read to you often. It said, but the wisdom from above is, first of all, pure. It's also peace-loving and gentle at all times, willing to yield to others. It's full of mercy and good deeds. It shows no favoritism. It's always sincere. That verse tells us about love. Why does it tell us about love, or how does it tell us about love? Because it's pure. When my love for others 
begins to be more pure like the love of Jesus, I'll find myself being more patient with those that are hard to be patient with. Amen. Next one he says is kind. I don't think we have a problem with kindness. In fact, the Bible says as God's been kind to us, we ought to be kind to others. As God has forgiven us, we ought to forgive others, right? Isn't that what the scripture says? Do you have any situations around you where you thought, I, I, that sure was kind of me? Maybe, maybe being kind is, is handing somebody a meal when you know they're starving. Maybe the kindness is um, when it's snowing. I would like to have some snow. Anybody? Okay, let's just go. Taking out that snow shovel and going to shovel somebody's driveway. <laughs> I guess we've got to move north. I don't know. Um, what is it that somebody else needs to see kindness? You know the one level of kindness that we don't always have? is a lock on our mouths. The kindness may be, shut up. <laughs> yeah, I said it out loud, y'all. It may be we need to not speak if God says not to speak. Anybody got an issue with that? Because I sure do. Sometimes I'd rather, sp the Bible says speak the truth in love, and sometimes it sure doesn't sound like, feel like, act like love. Kindness lifts. That's not what Satan does. He says here, patience, kindness, and then he gets into some other area. It says it's not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. Here's a good word for you. How about selfless? The real kind of love, God's kind of love, is a selfless kind of love. 2 Thessalonians 2.12. But then he will be condemned for enjoying evil rather than believing the truth. Here's the deal. When you believe that evil are doing things in a rotten, difficult selfish way is the right way, you will not have the love of God flowing through your life. He says, don't be jealous. I want to tell you, jealousy is a real deal. Anybody else want to say amen to that? Amen. I've had an issue with jealousy in the past. Some, some are worse than others, but when you are being jealous, realize it's, it's a God is maybe saying to you, this is not me. This is your flesh, or this is the wrong way. How about this, not boastful? How many of us want to say, hey, look at me, look at me, look at me. Look what I did, look what I have. We're always trying to buy things with money we don't have to impress people we don't like. I did say we because I'm involved in that. Here's the deal. If materialism is our God, we need to get rid of that because God is not our God. We need God. We don't need the stuff of this world. It's boastful. It's proud. I've said this, and others have taught me this before. What's the middle letter of the word pride? I. When I is in the way, you is not there. <laughs> in verse number five, he says again, it's not rude. <sighs> Got to be careful because sometimes we, the church, we Christians, we look like we're mad all the time. For far too long, and I've said it a hundred times and I'll say it a hundred more, for far too long the world around the church has known what the church is against. It's time that the world around the church knows what the church is for. And I want to tell you, we're for people. We're, we're for the underdog. We're here to speak justice for those who don't have justice. We're here to serve those who don't have. Why? Because we want to issue an opportunity for them to see and recognize the love of God. But when you're rude... When we're unkind, when we're impatient, do you know what we're doing? We're pushing people further from God than closer to God. James 4, 6 and 7. He gives grace generously. As the scripture says, God is opposed to the proud but gives grace to the humble. So humble yourselves before God. Resist the devil and flee from him. It's either God's way or the devil's way. It's either flesh or spirit. I, I don't know about you, but following the spirit changes things. Listen to Proverbs chapter 10, verse number 20. Hatred stirs up quarrels, but love makes offenses or makes up for all offenses. Not fences. Let me do that again. Hatred stirs up quarrels and love makes up for all offenses. Love and others, listen, it may stir them up, but it's going to stir them in the right direction. The last part of the characteristics of love is in verse number 6. And I want to just point this out. It does not rejoice with injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Here's a, a word in here I want you to see, and it's the word joy. Does the way I love that person in my life 
give them more joy and in more, more enjoyment in life. I believe that when we love like Jesus loves, people will end up with more joy and in more enjoyment in life. Do you agree or disagree? Figure it out. Hebrews 10, 24, let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. What did it say in verse number 6? It rejoices when the truth wins. It rejoices when we win. Do you know what we ought to be doing? We ought to be rejoicing with whoever wins. I really don't care who wins today. I'm sorry. I'm just being you know, honest. I'm, I, Super Bowl. I want Jesus to win. Last week we had six people who were baptized. Um, uh, the, what's going on in other churches around us? It's time to celebrate what they're doing. They may not look like us, act like us. They may worship differently than us. But you know what? If it's about Jesus, it's a win. Don't be jealous of other places. Don't be talking bad about other places. Because listen, your responsibility is at the church where you attend and where you pour yourself in. This is where my responsibility is. I may not understand them, but I need to be praying for them. And here's the deal. We need to celebrate when they win. It's time to put a smile on our face. When, when whoever wins today, and, and if it's the 49ers, let's, let's praise God. James, he's got, oof, there you go. Now, next year's going to be the Cowboys. <laughs> Hold on. I, I, I'm going to be even funnier. Next year will be the Chargers. <laughs> <laughs> Ain't going to happen. <laughs> Harbaugh is not hope, okay? That is not hope. That's, That's right. how do we win? Love is not demanding. Have you ever been demanding? I, I'm only demanding at one, one point during the day when I'm awake. Um, and, and that's just... Selfless or selfish? Full of pride or full of Jesus? The characteristic of Jesus is this, Philippians 2, 3, and 4. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble. Think of others first. Don't look out for your interests, your own interests, but also the interests of others. When we're not doing that, we're demanding. When we're not doing that, we're irritable. When we're not doing that, we keep up with the wrongs. But this scripture says that with love, real love, God's kind of love, doesn't keep up with wrongs. Galatians 5, 22, and, and just listen to Galatians 5. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of love in our lives, or this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. Let's go on a couple verses down. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives, and let us not become conceited, or provoke one another, or be jealous of one another. You see, real relationships need this, patience. Great relationships need kindness. Great relationships are built upon selflessness. The greatest of all relationships helps the other person win before I win. Does that make sense? I, I love the picture from an Olympic game. A runner goes down and somebody comes out of the stands grabs that runner up and finishes the race with him. Y'all ever heard that story before? The guy that came out of the stands was the man's father. I know another story about a, a young man that was in a wheelchair. He looked at his dad one day and he said, Dad, I want to run a marathon. Hold on, this kid's in a wheelchair. Dad is not a runner. If you go Google that story... They've now run 5Ks, 10Ks, and marathons with dad pushing a wheelchair. And they're winning together. It's time for us to push others to win. Here's an illustration for you. The character of love. How about this? The commitment of love. We're going to go quickly through this. The commitment of love. What, what does it say? Look at verse number. number um, oh, it's here, okay? I tell you. Seven, it says, love never gives up, love never loses faith, love is always hopeful and endures all circumstances. Here we go, love never gives up. You ever given up on somebody? Be careful, because I'm going to give you an illustration. There are times when I need to say no. 
and I don't use that word very often. I, I say yes a lot. But there are times when I say yes, here's the deal. I empty me of the possibility to take care of me and the possibility of taking care of my family because I give so much to others. Yeah, I want you to hear today. If you don't have anything in your cup and you try to fill somebody else's cup, are you filling their cup? No, you're probably taking from them. We need to have the opportunity to never give up. And the only way to never give up is to let our lives be so overflowing. Psalms 23, my cup overflows. The only way to have a cup that overflows is to be in the presence of God or go to the end of that. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The only way to have the mercy of God and the cup overflowing is to spend time in the presence of God. The only way to never give up is to spend time in the presence of God. Have you given up? Is there anything in your life that you've given up on? Let me give you some thoughts. Have you given up on God? Maybe you're like some others who have shaken their fist at God. God, why is it that you hate me? Or or God, why aren't you answering my prayers? Maybe he is. Maybe your prayers have turned so selfish that he's like, I'm going to give you the best, and the best is not what you're asking for. The closer you get to God, the more he'll give you what you pray for. Did you know that? I didn't say get close to God and you get all you want. I'm saying get close to God and he'll change your heart and he'll change your wants. This is good preaching to you. Should be good. Never give up. So have you given up on God? And some of you have given up on yourself. Do you know one of, the, one of the greatest things that we can do is build the value of the people around us? How do you do that? By loving them and letting them know that they're loved. How do you devalue somebody? Use them. Use them for your purpose and not theirs. We have an opportunity in life to never give up. How do we do that? Well, we don't give up because we know who God is. We don't give up because we know God's giving us value. Have it to people around us. We need to see people and understand people the way God made them. Remember what the Bible said about Jesus? He said he saw the people and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Y'all with me? How do we see people? Are we giving them value or taking their value from them? 1 Peter 4, 8 says, Most importantly of all, continue to show deep love for each other, for love covers a multitude of sins. Love covers a multitude of sins. So he says, never give up. And then he says, never lose faith. How do you lose faith? Well, it's easy. Don't ever feed your faith. Don't ever feed faith. What, what, what are we feeding? You know, here's what we do in life. We, we find the things that are the best, and we hang on to them, right? I'm saying we find the things that we think are best, and we hang on to them. But it seems like in, in, with all humanity, we, we squander things away. With all that money we'd be given, what'd you do with it? We squander it away. With all those friends that we had, what we do? Well, they've all left me. Why? Because you and I probably have not been feeding the kind of faith that's going to build us up rather than tear us down. We have the opportunity. Never give up. Never lose faith. Listen, again, this is faith in God, not faith in yourself, because you're going to fail you. Have anybody else ever failed you? I got a few people. Okay, let's go on. Again, we've been failed by each other, but Jesus has never failed us. He said it. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. Listen to John 3.30. He must become greater and greater. This is our, our verse from... Two years ago. Listen, he must become greater and greater, and I become less and less. How does that happen? By feeding our faith. Never lose his faith. What's the third one? Always full of hope. Y'all are full of something. (laughs) Is it hope? Is it the hope that's going to transfer us to a place where we think it's over? I'm at the end of my rope. Well, praise God, if you're at the end of your rope, draw like one of those not draw, tie a knot, (laughs) hold on. Do you know where God works best? At the end of the rope, the bottom of the barrel, the deepest valley, the darkest ravine. Why? Because in the place where the struggle is the worst, that God's light is going to shine the brightest, the brightest, the most for me. We need to understand. We need to always be full of hope. What is hope? Hebrews chapter 11, verse number one, things we can't see, things we don't understand, but if we believe, we need to hold on to hope. We need to, to demonstrate real hope. Listen to Romans 12, verse number 21. 
Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. How do we do that? To demonstrate real hope is to be good to one another or to love one another the way Jesus told us to do. What did he tell us to do? He said, be good to others. He says, give honor to others. Again, Romans chapter 12, verse number 10, be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourself. Real love honors the people around us. It says here, love never gives up. Never loses faith, always full of hope, and endures all kinds of circumstances. In relationships, we need to keep our faith and our hope strong and never give up on believing in and helping each other. How do we do that? By feeding what really lasts. The character of love, the commitment of love, and here's the last one, the constant of love. The most important thing that we always realize and think about in this scripture is Um, this one little tiny verse or part of a verse, verse number seven, (sighs) love never gives up. Or here we go. Love never ends. Do, Do we believe that? Do we believe that love goes on? Here's the deal. You and I have this kind of love in our lives, but sometimes have any of you ever fallen in love before? Yes. Okay. You have, have you ever had a hard time keeping that love real? You see, the girl I married, she's not in here, and please don't go tell her. She was pretty. She didn't have any money. I didn't either. But she kissed like nobody else I've ever been kissed before. before. (laughs) Have things changed? 30, almost 31 years. I'm just as handsome as I was then. (laughs) (laughs) There's more of me to love. Actually, I'm smaller today than when I got married. Whatever you look at longingly and lovingly will become bigger and better in your eyes. The less I feed the love I have for my wife, the less love I have for my wife. Whatever you look at longingly and lovingly, you become like and you love more. If you've been looking at God and His love, you will love Him and know that you're loved by Him. Go with me? What is the constant of love? God is love. The constant is this. Love lasts forever. You can look at verse number 8. It says it right there. Prophecy is going to pass away. Other gifts, it speaks specifically about knowledge and about speaking in tongues. It says they're going to pass away. And let me give you some theological truth here. We're not talking about the gifts of the Spirit passing away before Jesus comes back. We're talking about eternity because love's going to transform us and change us for eternity. The strongest thing today is not that you have a gift from God to do something for the church. The strongest thing you have today is you are loved by God and you are loving others for Him. In fact, really, this is the fact. To know that you have the Spirit inside you is not by you exercising some spiritual gift. It's by love. They'll know them by your love. They'll know we're disciples by our love for one another. That's what the scripture says. Y'all with me? Psalms 103 verse 8. The Lord is compassionate and merciful, slow to anger and filled with unfailing love. Do you know what this love does? This love opens our understanding. Right now, we don't understand everything. Do we have anybody here that knows everything? Oh, let me ask that again. Do we have any teenagers in the room? <laughs> well, I may not. Um, I've met some people that think they know everything. They don't. Don't tell them, though. I'd ruin the story. Here's the deal. We don't know it all. <laughs> and the older I get, the more I realize, the less I know. And the more I realize, the less I need the one who really does know. You know there's going to come a day... We're going to get to heaven, and there's some things I'm going to ask God. I got a list. Anybody got a list? God, why in the world did you let that happen? God, did you see? You made that baby ugly. I'm not talking about any of the recent baby at all, okay? <laughs> I'm surprised at some of the things that happen in the world. But you know what? And I've learned this more and more. Listen up. Did you know that God's got the end in mind? And the reason why I didn't get what I wanted yesterday or 10 days ago is because he knows that in 10 years, what I would have gotten 10 days ago, if I asked what I asked for, it would have killed what I needed 10 years from now. 
See, God's got the end in mind. He knows what I need, when I need it. And we're going to understand, here's the deal, trust him. Love never gives up. Love never loses faith. Love never loses hope because it's always full of hope and enduring every circumstance. Why? Because he is God and he is the one that has everything we need. 1 Corinthians 1.27. Instead, God chose the things of this world the world considers foolish in order to shame those who think they're wise. He chose things that are powerless to shame those who were powerful. Let me just give you a couple of thoughts. Who loves you the most? That's good, Ricardo. God does. In this world... The people we can see, who loves you the most? Your mama. That's good. Who loves you the most? It's good. Anybody else? Your dog. You can kick the dog. You can be mean to the dog. And the next time you come home, he's going to be wagging his tail. (laughs) I was wagging my tail there, okay? Isn't he? I mean, have have you noticed that? No matter what? We need to have... We need to have that kind of love for each other. I don't know about you. I, I've met some people, and Cass, your mom was one of those. You know, we can have hard, hard conversations, and we turn back the next day, and Sandra just loves me. Us, you. That's the kind of love we need to have for each other. I, we did get that on film. You'll probably see it later. Holden, you better not rip that out of that sermon. I've got to get back. I lost something. Yeah. Love holds us for the... Y'all come on. I, I, I need help. <laughs> Verse number 10. When the time of perfection comes, the partial things will become useless. Are y'all Okay. It's much more time. I'm grateful you for you, our church family. I'm going to go back to Cuba in six or eight weeks, and I'm excited about that, and I'm going to need some of you to help me pay for that trip and to love on those people because we're going to take the Cuba FCA staff on a trip, and um, I'm excited about that. I'm excited about our kids, um, uh, Ruth and, excuse me, Rebecca and Coleman. I'm probably going to move somewhere else. He's in the Army. Not sure where yet. Probably closer to us. That's going to be great. Okay, Maybe Kansas. Maybe they'll be in Kansas City. Maybe they'll have a winning team or something. I'm looking forward to spending time with my kids. We're going to go see Ruth in a week or so. This week I'm going to fly home and see my brothers. And I, and I love my brothers, Rick and Steve. And, uh, we're going to sell my dad's house this week. I never lived in that house. And so that makes it a little easier. But it doesn't. Because the more they're gone, the more I miss them. Lost your daddy, I know. I remember. When the perfect time comes, he's going to take all this stuff that we've dealt with and we're going to see it clearly. Oh God, I see what you're doing. I see why you did that. I don't know today why the struggle is so struggled. I don't know why what happens happens, but I know who's in charge, and it's not me or you. Why? Philippians 3, 13 and 14. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on one thing, forgetting what's in the past, looking forward to what lies ahead. You see, I press on to reach the end of the race, receiving the heavenly prize for which God from Jesus Christ is calling us. Tony Evans said it this way. One day when we experience the joyous intimacy of God's presence, spiritual gifts will come to an end because we no longer need them. But not love, because love never ends. Hebrews 12, 12. So take a new grip with your tired hands and strengthen your weak knees. Why? Because in our relationships... We need to keep our eyes on what really matters. God is love. Let's go love people for him. Lord God, we thank you for the day. Lord, we thank you that you are 
love. You're patient and kind and never rude or jealous. God, help me to be that way. Patient and kind. God, I I don't understand all this stuff, but I've got to trust you. And that's what we just talked about. But God, help us to understand that there's a day coming when I'll get it or we'll understand. But until then, I need you to hold me. I need to lean on you. God, do we need to lean on you? Yeah, you said yeah. I, I know that. Lord, there's some folks hearing today or here today that need to lean. Lean hard. Because our love and our, our, our relationships sure don't look like what you want them to. But I want it to be that way, God. I want, I want to be like you. I want others to know that they're loved. So God, help me act more like, talk more like, be more like Jesus. God, for my wife and kids, I want them to hear Jesus, see Jesus. I pray that for our church staff and those who work here every day. God, help me to be such an example that I'll see Jesus and know him and understand him. Lord, we need you today. Lord, I... Help us to lean on you, Jesus. Help us to have lives that are filled with your glory, Jesus. Because we need you. I need you. I need you. Anybody anybody else need to say that? I, I, I need you, Jesus. I pray this in your precious and powerful name. In Jesus' name.